In 1881, the Tsar of Russia, Alexander II, was assassinated. Anti-Jewish feeling, never far from the surface, made the Jews scapegoats. Large numbers were expelled from Russia and Eastern Europe. It was a disaster, but for Leeds, it was an unexpected piece of luck. Many of the Jews, sailing from Northern Europe, landed at Hull and worked their way across Northern England, on their way, it said, to Liverpool, the Atlantic, and the land of milk and honey on the other side of it. On the way, they stopped at Leeds, and many of them went no further. By the end of Queen Victoria's reign, 15,000 Jews had settled in Leeds. Well, let's follow those Jewish immigrants through the streets of Leeds as we continue our exploration of the city. Because their arrival can be taken as signalling the start of the modern era. It wasn't only that they set up small shops and workshops to supplement the output of the clothing factories. They had precisely the skills as tailors which were necessary in a city in which the old cloth halls and the merchants had less of a role to play, which had entered the field of ready-made clothing. The first firm to really exploit their skills was Barron's, whose founder had built this extraordinary warehouse in 1878, St. Paul's House. Barron's were pioneers, soon followed by many others. By the year 1900, Leeds had huge factories using mechanized cutting knives and sewing machines making garments and selling them at the rate of about five million a year. Within an astonishingly short time of arriving, the Jewish community had got organized. The inscription on a building in Regent Street suggests that they were able to found unions almost on arrival. They took only a little longer to organize religiously. The great synagogue in Chapel Town Road was one of a succession. Commonwealth immigrants have now in turn moved into the inner city areas first occupied by the Jews, just as the Jews themselves had to some extent displaced Irish immigrants who had occupied the area some 50 years earlier. Far-reaching changes were happening in the shape of Leeds Industries in the early years of the 20th century. Two were especially significant. The first was the decision of Joseph Hepworth and Sons, taken about 1883, not only to manufacture garments, but to sell them in their own retail shops. The second, elaborating upon Barron's example, was the development of bespoke, made-to-measure clothing in wholesale quantities. It was Montague Burton who innovated this, a piece of simple brilliance, like all strokes of genius, when he appreciated that most people have physical similarities and that it must be possible to apply mass production methods to individual tailoring by the use of standard ranges of dimensions and thus provide a cheap tailor-made suit for the working man virtually off the peg. By 1921, Burton's Hudson Road Mills were the biggest thing of their kind in the country. Industry in Leeds not only grew in size, it developed a great variety as well, into manufactures of all kinds, from locomotives to footballs. Today, half the working population of the city is employed in manufacturing industries. This broad base and variety is said to have kept Leeds stable and prosperous. Against that background of manufacturing industry, 
studies in science and technology, and then in the humanities, were appropriately developed. This is the Cloth Workers' Court, built in 1877 to 79, with a grant from the Worshipful Company of Cloth Makers, the nucleus of what was to become one of the biggest universities in the United Kingdom. From that nucleus has developed the present complex of steel and glass and concrete, including what's said to be the longest straight corridor in Europe. The first university in this country to have a systematic plan for growth in numbers. It houses faculties of science and technology that have developed in close partnership with the industries of the city. In the arts, music and education, Leeds became much more than just a manufacturing town. The university brings together one of the most prestigious academic communities in the country and also one of the most comprehensive when the other associated branches of higher education are considered, the City of Leeds and Carnegie Colleges of Education and the Polytechnic. Let's go back to the clothing industry. It's essential to the understanding of the clothing industry, and indeed of most modern industry, and of the development of all towns since the Industrial Revolution, that the market which makes such developments possible is the mass market and not the specialized prestige one. It's at the moment that the majority of people can afford to go shopping. And that includes the working man and the working woman that the modern town centre takes off. Until that time, the specialised prestige market required only small traders and small workshops. The very notion of the high street as a shopping centre is an entirely modern one. It involves the mass market and shops like this. In 1884, Michael Marx, a Polish Jewish immigrant, set up his famous Penny Bazaar in Leeds Market. His son, Simon, who took over the business in 1909, recognized the possibilities of selling quality goods of many kinds and built up a chain of stores, Marx and Spencer, which have had a profound effect on almost all town centers in Great Britain, as well as in Leeds itself. The multiple store, with its increasingly sophisticated methods of selling and the need for large floor spaces, has become a feature of all town centres. The town centre, in other words, became a commercial centre for shopping and for offices. Brigads, the street on which the whole commerce of Leeds had been originally based, was now gradually lined with chain stores. The old yards became backyards. The residents moved out and then moved back in to do their shopping. Then the whole place went through another drastic change, of which the very symbol and the reality was the hedgerow. Until 1924, the hedgerow was merely a lane at the top end of the town at right angles to Brigitte. Widening and extending it effectively turned Leeds round again. The original grain of the city ran north to south. The Industrial Revolution and Gotts Mill had turned it back to front. Now the Shopping Revolution turned it on its side, for now the city centre ran east to west, with the new hedgerow as the posh shopping street. The hedgerow was designed by an eminent architect, Sir Reginald Blomfield. No one could pretend that architecturally it was likely to send the spirit soaring, but it opened the way to major department stores who built in a style more or less in keeping with Sir Reginald's. It really was the grand new city street. But at the end of it, how typical of this unpredictable city, they built not another public building, not a monument, not a memorial, but the biggest block of council flats in Europe, Quarry Hill.
It was unusual enough to make council housing the main feature of a civic development, especially as it took the place of some particularly bad slums. It was even more unusual to build a huge scheme of a wholly experimental and revolutionary nature, which has been a visiting place for town planners and housing managers from all over the world ever since. It was part of the brief that not more than one-fifth of the site should be built upon. The rest was to be open space. Quarry Hill was designed and built between 1934 and 1940, with its strange parabolic arches inspired by housing estates in Vienna and Berlin in the 20s and 30s. It has a shopping centre, playgrounds, a laundry and a day nursery. It should have had a social centre and a sports area but these were not built after the war. It has a site of 26 acres, containing 938 flats and housing over 3,000 people. Leeds had a frightening backlog of 19th century housing. Just 50 years ago, seven out of 10 of the houses of Leeds were back-to-backs. Many of these houses, of course, were beautifully kept by proud and hard-working occupants, but by any modern measure, they were substandard and had to go. Leeds became a pioneer of council housing, and beginning in the 20s, has tried out almost every type of council house that can be seen in this country. Surprisingly, Leeds was not seriously bombed during the Second World War. Perhaps because of that, it didn't start to redevelop itself seriously until much later than many other cities. It enabled Leeds to avoid some of the obvious mistakes made in the course of hurried rebuilding by other cities. But it also meant that when redevelopment did start in the late 50s, it was an explosion. In effect, nothing less than the rebuilding of the city. There were two urgent needs. First, to replace the substandard housing and cope with the post-war housing shortage. The second was the need to do something about the traffic. The coincidence of those two needs geographically meant that almost the whole of the inner ring of the city could be rebuilt. With new housing, and new commercial areas, open space, landscaping and new roads. Taking the place of the old congested areas of industrial housing and semi-derelict small works. The whole city centre could effectively be redesigned to form an entirely new kind of urban landscape with grass and trees and shrubs and roads and buildings set in among them and seizing the chance to form new routeways for people on foot between the city centre and the housing areas punctuated with areas for sitting out and paved pedestrian platforms and incorporating historic monuments like the Brunswick Methodist Church of 1825 hidden behind the trees there behind me. Let me explain what's been happening to the city of Leeds this way. This is the River Eyre running from the west over towards the east and down to the sea. Now, the spine of Leeds has always been the road leading 
from the south to the north. That is Brigat. That leads down to Wakefield and to London, and to the north leads up to Harrogate. Over the years, the other main radial routes have developed. To York, to the west, over towards Keithley, up towards Otley, and over here towards Bradford. Now, the fundamental change that happened to Leeds was this. Benjamin Gott put his factory at Beenings on that side of the city center. There were already factories near the river, again, on the south side of the river, and also clustering around what had become the inner ring of the city, like that. Now, the process I have just been describing did this. If Gott's Mill and the Industrial Revolution had turned the city back to front, the result of the present policies and of the transport revolution has been to turn it inside out. That's to say, the factories move out to the perimeter. Why are they on the perimeter? Because all factories must have access to communications, and on that perimeter, there had been built a large outer ring road to which the factories have access. And in the space created in the center of the city, they could now build and create a new landscape and put some housing and some offices in among it. The aim has been to develop a pleasant and continuous landscape between working, playing and living areas. The most urgent housing needs have been met, sometimes at the expense of the other related facilities. Now the policy is concentrated on producing more varied kinds of environment. Leeds has abandoned the multi-storey blocks of the 60s and is placing emphasis on the environment as a whole, not only the houses, but the spaces around them. This one is a prize-winning scheme, Town Street at Chapel Allerton. It's council housing, but it's also housing with a firm character of its own. At Holt Park, north of the city, all the facilities of a new town will be integrated into a varied, split-level landscape. It's still a long way from completion, but what a contrast to the high-rise towers or Quarry Hill. The continuous landscape will also incorporate the revivification of the canal and the river air, for so long despoiled by industry and neglected by the people as a potentially valuable leisure facility. The gates. Having been for centuries a city founded on the waterways, Leeds, with dramatic suddenness, has become the city at the crossroads of the motorways. Access to the south is provided by the M1. Access eastwards to Hull and westwards to Liverpool, achieving at last a successful crossing of the Pennines, is by the M62. Leeds, right in the middle of the network, claims for itself the title of capital of its region, a capital undergoing an office building boom. It's the logical place for London businesses to establish their branches, a center for insurance and finance, a major service and distribution point. The motorways and rapid air and rail links have brought Leeds closer to London, made its attitudes less provincial and contributed to the city's new and growing sense of its identity. This sense of identity is emphasized by broadcasting. Leeds is the television and radio center for a vast part of the north and east points. of England. But it was good to see Roger Miller got okay. 10 points out of the Let's 13 with the whole chaos scored. Oh, and maybe one from the water, put against the Aussies this year. Dewsbury, you remember last Sunday at Brown Flat, Stevenson couldn't kick goals. He did today. 
And there's no doubt as to the role football has played in the emergence of Leeds. Mention the name of Leeds anywhere in Europe, and it's quite likely you'll be met with a smile of recognition. Ah, yes, Johnny Giles, Norman Hunter. But as always with the city, it's back to practical matters. Whatever may have been the source of its fame in the past, it's as the motorway city of the 70s that Leeds now officially wishes itself to be known. Motorway works costing £40 million are ringing the inner city, part of a scheme the success of which is of vital interest to many European towns. If, as is often said, there's to be an energy crisis and a drastic reduction in the number of motor cars, then all this expenditure could turn out to be a planning disaster. But if, as I suspect, the energy crisis will be solved one way or another, and we continue to make large numbers of individual journeys, then Leeds is well advanced on the right road. What makes the centre of Leeds, for good or ill, a signpost to the city of the future, is the reorganisation of its streets and of its traffic. In the early 60s, it was one of the cities examined in the Buchanan report on traffic in towns. But it had already begun its own traffic planning. In uh, partnership with central government, it worked out a major study and carried out some massive construction works in pursuit of what is called the Leeds approach. And that approach has already had a profound influence on traffic planning and redevelopment in other major cities. The inner ring road, cutting through below the level of the existing streets, is to take cross-town traffic and guide it away from the city centre. It links to radial roads, leading to the suburbs and to other towns, but also to the M1 and M62. Now, perched on the edge of that inner ring road is the first of a series of multi-storey car parks. And that indicates the special nature of this plan. For the whole reorganisation of the city is devised not to cater for all the motor cars which are forecast, nor for their exclusion, if indeed that were possible. It's based upon a very simple, and it seems to me, profound idea that the key to an integrated transport system is parking. What matters, after all, what ultimately determines the crowdedness and bustle of a city centre is not how many cars get through, but what the people do with the cars when they leave them. In every city, a large number leave their cars, occupying space for a whole day while they themselves stay in an office. For them, it's better to leave the cars outside the city centre, in one of the car parks. Some others must bring them in. Traders and shopkeepers must have access. Others, many others, are going shopping. The essence of the Leeds approach is to give priority of access to vehicles used for business and shopping and to set a limit to private car commuting. And the key to that is to provide parking in the central area for only 20% of the possible demand from commuters. And that is possible only by developing an efficient system of public transport. Express bus services, city centre buses and park and ride services from the suburbs to the central areas. The scheme is already in operation, and from the look of it, it's becoming very popular. The reorganisation of the traffic has made possible the next part of the plan, a most imaginative and exciting redirection of the central streets, which puts Leeds in the forefront of planning experiments.
For the new roads and the parking policies have made it possible to transform some of those Victorian streets in the city centre into an extensive pedestrian precinct. The largest in the country and, it's said, the largest in Europe. And what a revelation it is. Start near the eastern end, where it links to Brigitte, the spine of the original town, and to the arcades, seeming to extend them to the full and bring them all together. A long paved walk that were once streets, with varied paving and occasional sets, trees and sculptures. And suddenly, the old streets are a revelation. They invite you to raise your eyes and look at the buildings and see for the first time what you had never noticed before. The town and its buildings come to life, and astonishingly, you're in the midst no longer of drab Victorian gloom, but of Victorian vulgarity and fun. Go right along to the west end of it, into the office area first developed in the early 19th century, to Bond Court, to see where the foot streets relate to the traffic streets, where cars poke their noses mildly through a facade, and see what the scale is of a modern town centre, the scale of the courts that take the place of the old, smaller courts of the early industrial era. For this is the very heart, not just of the city, but of the matter. Can a modern city, with its crowds and its bustle, its vast assembly of consumer goods, its commuters and its traffic, its cars and its buses and other machines that are likely to be invented, can the modern city still keep a human scale, one which we can recognise, where we can belong and have some dignity and self-respect, where the people can enjoy living in the heart of a city? The experiment with the foot streets of Leeds is an attempt to achieve just that. To think a little more of people, to cater for just enough machines, but ultimately to relate it all to man. To put him back on his feet and give him freedom. To move around, to think, to see, to talk, to engage in the life of his city. I think that Leeds has at last rediscovered itself and can look at itself again. Is this to be the model of the modern city, catering for new needs but retaining some of its past? If so, what sort of city will it be? The city of work and money? The city of faceless blocks and human misery? Or the city of people? The city of man?